Hello, everyone. I'm Celia Becker, an executive in the Africa Regulatory and Business Intelligence Department at ENS, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the fourth of our Investing in Africa webinars. This will be one of many conversations featuring a multidisciplinary team of experts across multiple jurisdictions on the continent, where together we will discuss how to navigate the complexities of investing in Africa. Today's session is focused on regulatory developments in Kenya, impacting on the investment climate in the country. I'm joined by my colleagues from the ENS Nairobi office, and I'm pleased to introduce you to Mahesh Acharya, a senior partner in the office specializing in, amongst other things, corporate M&A and technology. Welcome, Mahesh. Thanks, Celia. Thanks. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm George Matia, a, a tax executive. Thank you, Celia. Good afternoon. Faith Chebet, who specializes in employment and corporate law. Good afternoon, everyone. Anthony Gakura, a corporate um, M&A um, executive. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Celia. Good afternoon, everyone. And last but not least, Dennis Kataro, who focuses on intellectual property. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all of you, and we look forward to an interesting conversation. Um, to our attendees, please feel, please feel free to post any questions that you may have in the Q&A box, and we will respond to you after the session. Mahesh, um, if I could start with you, um, what is your current view on the general investment climate in Kenya? Great. Um, <laughs> thanks, Celia. Uh, look, I, I'll, I'll probably... Um spend some time uh, dealing with that question in, in two parts. So I'll, just for the benefit of, of uh, the audience uh, coming from, from various parts uh, of the continent and also interested in various parts of the continent, I'll, I'll provide some statistics and views on, uh, on the trends we are seeing on the continent and then probably discuss uh, the way, where I think the opportunities lie and the likely hindrances on, on FDI generally, if, if, if you don't mind. Um, so, so last year saw Africa's return as a top investment destination for global investors. Uh, the continent had struggled to attract investments uh, since COVID-19, but, but we, we did see a, a pickup in 2022. Um, and, and while many across the continent aim to increase their focus towards the east and the global south, uh, for now, the Western Hemisphere remains the largest investor into Africa. Um, what, what did we see happen uh, in, in the last 18 months? So South Africa led in terms of number of FDI projects, but interestingly, Egypt was the largest recipient in, in FDI value. And uh, uh, an interesting statistic is clean tech emerged as a leading sector. What does all this um, look like in numbers? So FDI rose by 64% uh, in project numbers. Uh, the continent led 730 plus projects, about $200 billion in capital, uh, creating about 150,000 jobs. From an East Africa perspective, Kenya still remains the dominant player in terms of investment. Nigeria is the largest uh, recipient in West Africa. And whilst these two are the third and fourth largest in the continent, um, South Africa and Egypt are at the top. Um, an interesting dynamic, which contrasts what I had said earlier around, you know, the, the West being a key investor. The UAE became a prominent investor, not the largest, but a prominent one in the continent and has committed about $50 billion in, in capital. Um, so, so how did Kenya feature in, in all this? Um, FDI increased by 117%. Uh, we received about 60 projects. Uh, $2 billion, generating about 8,000 jobs. So, so still a small percentage when you look at the rest of the continent, but significant compared to, to the COVID and pre-COVID period. Um, main sectors were business services, technology, transport, and warehousing. Uh, the US led uh, uh, the investment uh, numbers, uh, but this was largely because of the single pharmaceuticals project accounting for the largest capital inflow um, and uh, created, or it's projected to create a uh, significant number of jobs uh, in the country. And, and this is the Moderna facility for vaccine production. Uh, apart from the US, there was significant inflow 
from uh, the rest of Africa, particularly from Nigeria, Mauritius, and South Africa. Um, so, so what's the outlook for Kenya, um, just generally from FDI terms, without necessarily touch, touching on uh, the specific topics that the rest of the team are going to speak on? Um, so after after the pandemic, of course, uh, the, there was, you know, there has been some impact because of the severe drought we've seen in, in, in the country. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war hasn't helped much. But uh, we've received... World Bank and IMF funding to help navigate deficits in foreign reserve levels. Uh, and in the same vein, you know, there is some anti-government sentiment which negates some of some of that uh, that action. Nonetheless, there are various positives, which the rest of the panel will discuss in more detail, including uh, the recently signed trade agreement with the EU, expanding trade and investment opportunities, boosting agriculture, and streamlining customs procedures. Last year, the U.S. And, and Kenya launched the U.S.-Kenya Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership, which commits to increase investment and support to African regional economic integration. Egypt, on the other hand, continues to be particularly interested in the manufacturing sector. Now, um, I, I touched on clean tech as being the, the leading investment sector. And so a little bit more about this and what's happening in that space. Um, so clean tech, like I say, uh, uh, was the first time led the FDI drive into, into Africa. Um, investors are attracted to the, the renewable energy sector underlining the appeal of the region's clean tech industry. Um, there are several new projects and deals which have been announced, focusing on geothermal and wind power. So we think there'll be more opportunities in this space. Um, the government lifted a 18-month uh, suspension on the licensing of new IPPs uh, in a bid to boost generation capacity. Uh, in the same vein, the UK Prime Minister and our President agreed at uh, COP27 to fast-track six green energy projects worth about $4 billion. One of these is the Menengai Geothermal Project uh, with a planned capacity of, of 35 megawatts. Uh, similarly, the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in December last year announced its intention to invest $55 billion in Africa over the next three years, 15 of which will be in trade, investment commitments, deal partnerships uh, in sustainable energy, health systems, agribusiness, digital connectivity, infrastructure and finance. So you can see the theme. Um, that, that's where a lot of, of the work uh, is going to be. That's where a lot of the interest is going to be, uh, be in. Uh, I talked about the UAE. So we also have the SEPA partnership with the UAE in relation to the $50 billion I had spoken about earlier. Um, what, what, so so whilst, whilst all this is interesting and, and the team will sp speak a little bit more on, on specifics, uh, it's, it's not smooth sailing in all respects in relation to investments on the continent. There are some problems. Um, so it's it's important that we, we take cognizance of these. Um, in the case of Egypt and Nigeria, a pegged currency has led to major distortions in the business environment. Seems to be the case in other parts of the continent. In South Africa, the lack of economic reform has similarly led to, to weak growth. Um, the rest of the continent, including East Africa and, and Kenya in, in particular, uh, has been significantly impacted by both monetary policy tightening and the strengthening dollar. As a result, central banks uh, across the globe uh, are fighting to tame inflation and interest rates rise. Um, having said that, and, and maybe uh, a conversation for some of the economists, um, there is, there is a thought that the interest rate hikes across the continent uh, have either peaked or are close to peaking. And so the benefit of these rates are likely to come through in 2024, uh, early 2025. Um, and, and just to sum up, uh, in addition to these investment opportunities, there is a recognition that there are certain areas that governments and particularly governments in East Africa need to concentrate on in order to attract this, this FDI. And the three areas that I think are, are going to be key for this are 
uh, tackling youth unemployment and promoting skills development. The second one is a need to improve agriculture output to address food security. And, and the third one, which I think is, is quite important, at least from, from an East African perspective, is managing public finance and national debt levels to avoid uh, defaults. So, so that, Celia, is, is my summary of the, the env investment environment and, and where I think uh, opportunities uh, will lie. Thanks, Mahesh. I think despite all the challenges, there, there does seem to be quite a few opportunities in Kenya especially. So, Anthony, I think in that same vein, are there any specific sectors of the economy that, that you would say present growth opportunities in, um, in Kenya? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Celia. Um, just picking up um, on where Mahesh left, I think there are a number of opportunities for foreign and uh, local direct um, investors who would you know, want to come into the country to invest. Um, one of the key areas which is opening up and which is looking you know, quite hot at the moment is the privatization sector. And we have you know, a new privatization act which um, sort of seems um, quite streamlined, quite uh, efficient. Um, and the gov government has sort of set out you know, about 11 um, um, state-owned corporations which um, will go into a privatization um, mechanism. And, and so with, with the new legislation coming into effect and, and the new process um, um, of um, you know, privatization of uh, state corporations, you're looking at, um, at investors coming to the country having an easier process um, um, coming into, into the market. Now, some of the state corporations which have been identified um, are broad range. And you're looking at um, agriculture, you're looking at uh, you know, conference facilities, uh, you're looking at the oil and gas sector, um, and, and you know, having an easier process for the investors to come through um, using the new privatization act um, sort of um, invigorates the um, investment environment in Kenya. Now, now the, what the privatization act does is that it simplifies the whole process of um, um, converting what you call uh, state corporations into private entities. You've got a simplified process where the cabinet sec secretary identifies um, entities in the country which um, would be privatized. And after that, the parliament uh, approves um, those entities. Um, then the privatization authority, which has been set up, would uh, set up the entities um, for, you know, privatization. And this can be by various ways. It can be by IPO, it can be by public tender, or any other means which the cabinet secretary would um, approve. Um, I know there are a lot of, you know, social, political, uh, you know, conversations going around. Um, is this process correct? Is you know are we looking at um, situations where certain investments will be called upon in future? But our view is, as long as this process has been properly followed, and as long as you're getting the right approvals for the investment in accordance with the law, then your investment will you know be solid. If I would use that term. So, so privatization of, of you know corporate um, government entities is, is one of the areas which you know investors who are coming into Kenya would uh, uh, be required to look at you know kidney. Um, um, the other area which um, is is quite um, you know hot in Kenya is the telco side, um, and and what the government has done is to uh, scrap off um, the local shareholding requirements. So initially on the telco side, we had a requirement where um, um, you were required to ensure that local telco companies have at least 30% local shareholding. Um, that requirement has been passed off and we've seen you know, local um, 
uh, players and uh, foreign investors coming um, into the country on you know 100 percent um, owned uh, companies um, and you know we've got the likes of global entities like uh, um, uh, SpaceX we've got the uh, likes of uh, um, Google and and what this does is that by by removing the local shareholding requirement then you're sort of uh, improving the environment um, of, of, of the, the investment environment. Um, um, because uh, you, you've got a situation where foreign investors will not want um, um, to be you know, conjoined with, with uh, local investors or will have their own you know, requirements in terms of what they want in terms of um, um, investing into the local economy. So by, by, by you know, having an economy which you know, removes the local shareholding requirement, then you're sort of uh, um, allowing a lot of participants to come into the market um, in an environment where you know, they can push in um, as much capital as they want, they can run the companies on a global perspective as, as they do run them in other countries. Now the other um, area, which is um, um, you know, uh, which sort of looks quite interesting to investors, is the uh, mining sector. Um, so previously there was a moratorium on um, you know foreigners and uh, um, you know local uh, entities acquiring uh, mining licenses in the country. Um, and, and this moratorium has been there from 2019. So around October, um, uh, September this year, the government lifted the moratorium on um, mining licenses. And, and this sort of allows foreign investors to you know, come into the country and sort of source of, uh, sort, sort of source um, the the um, mining licenses which they would like to, you know, receive in a country, uh, mining activity which they would like to conduct, and and the lifting of the moratorium itself sort of allows um, investors to um, um, sort of look at what's new in the country, what they can get into in terms of um, prospecting, in terms of uh, getting mineral rights. Um, um, the other area which I would sort of like to delve into would be the uh, capital markets uh, area. Uh, and so, so the capital markets in Kenya have been sort of ranked as not uh, performing quite well. Uh, and what, what has happened is that the Capital Markets Authority has sort of reacted to this um, perception. And, and what they have done is that they have um, looked at the listing requirements in the country. And, and what they're doing is that they're reconsidering you know, what, what the listing conditions would need to be uh, met by you know uh, companies which want to list on the capital markets, uh, and you know based on the um, uh, commercial principles, uh, based on um, the economic environment in the market, then they're sort of relooking at reducing the minimum requirements so that you've got some sort of vibrancy in the capital markets. Um, the, the other thing which the, the Capital Markets Authority has done is to introduce um, what they call the block, block trade uh, trading. And with the block trade trading, uh, so initially, uh, when you're conducting trades of, of certain you know, blocks or certain percentages on the capital markets, you will need to do sort of these transfers as, as private transfers away from, from the capital markets. But, but with the introduction of blockchain uh, transfers, what the capital markets is, is sort of allowing is, you know, the implementation of um, block transfers between five to 24% of um, um, the shares in listed companies uh, between entities. So that sort of invigorates um, you are trading in in uh, capital markets. 
Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, I think very interesting. And there seems to be lots of developments that are very attractive, especially for foreign investors. Uh, so, George, from a tax point of view, I think we've seen lots of news coming out of Kenya, Kenya over the last year or so, lots of changes happening in the country and so on. Um, what is your perspective of the current tax environment and, and how investor-friendly um, would you deem that to be? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Celia. Um, I'll, I'll so probably break this discussion into three uh, to, to just uh, make it uh, much clearer. Um, and look at it from a point of entry, operational, and, and exit perspective. Um, from an entry perspective, there are various types of uh, legal entities that you know, investors can, can choose uh, to set up, uh, the most common being companies, branches, and uh, limited liability partnerships. Now, from a taxation point of view, um, the, the effective tax rates for, for these entities have pretty much been harmonized. So if you're looking at a company or a branch, the effective tax rate is you know at around forty percent, which is quite similar. Yeah, for an LLP, limited liability partnership, this is deemed to be a transparent vehicle, and the partners would then get taxed on themselves directly. So if their partners are set up as a company, then they would get taxed at thirty percent, or if it's a branch, it's still thirty percent. So very few nuances between you know if you set up either as a company or as a branch. In terms of, you know, during the operations of the entity that is set up, um, the legal system in Kenya is based on English common law, uh, with you know primary legislation being our constitution and, and various acts of parliament which uh, which regulate the different taxes. Yeah, the system, the tax system in Kenya is a self assessment self assessment regime system. So what that means is, you know, every taxpayer would compute their own uh, what they what they think is the correct tax uh, for each year of income, and then they would declare that to the tax authorities, and the tax authorities would then vet it. Um, and and you know if they need to do an audit, then they'll come and do an audit on the same. Um, the headline taxes in Kenya, we've got corporate income tax. I had mentioned earlier um, at a rate of thirty percent for a company and for a branch. Um, it's quite the same. Uh, tax losses in Kenya can be carried forward in perpetuity, uh, and this doesn't change even if there's a change in shareholding uh, of the entity in Kenya or abroad. Um, we've got restrictions on deductibility of interest, where if you're financing the, the entity in Kenya through loans, then any interest that is in excess of 30% of the entity's EBITDA, which is the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization, then that gets disallowed. So some planning around how the entity in Kenya is financed uh, should be taken into account. We've got a VAT regime, uh, which is quite similar to what you find in you know, other African countries. Uh, we've got different rates, we've got 0% rate, which generally applies on exports and you know, uh, other specified supplies. Uh, we've got an exempt uh, supplies which are deemed to be exempt. Uh, and we've also got standard rated supplies at a rate of 16%. Um, Kenya levies withholding taxes on some payments. Uh, if you're looking at payments of dividends, interests, uh, royalties, uh, technical fees, then you know there will be some withholding taxes uh, to grapple with here. Um, and the top rate is about 20% for non-residents in the case of say a royalty or uh, uh, or a management fee. Uh, interest and dividends are subject to tax at 15 yeah, percent if paid to a non-resident. The resident rates are quite uh, are much lower so you'd be looking at a rate of five percent if you're making a dividend payment to a resident uh, person or five percent if you're making a payment in, you know, in relation to a service to a resident person. Um, it's worth pointing out that Kenya has uh, concluded double taxation treaties with uh, about 15 countries. Uh, most of these countries are in Europe, uh, France, Germany, Denmark, Sweden. And, and these treaties in some instances would reduce uh, the withholding tax rates or completely eliminate it. So if you're looking at say a payment from Kenya to France for say you know, management of professional fees, then assuming the entity in France doesn't have presence in Kenya, then 
there should be no withholding in terms of applicable on such a period. Yeah? If you're looking at a country such as UK, then you'll, you, you get a reduced withholding tax rate of 12.5% from 20%. Yeah. Uh, in Africa, the only countries that Kenya has concluded double tax treaties with uh, South Africa and Zambia would still have preferential rates uh, provided for uh, certain payments. Now, the applicability of uh, double tax treaties in Kenya has, uh, uh, you know, can be challenged depending on, you know, if it is seen that uh, the, the reduction or the exemption that you know someone has taken advantage of uh, was done so you know incorrectly yeah so so what what the local laws have provided is there are instances where a treaty may be deemed not to be applicable uh, if it is seen uh, to result to an abuse of the uh, the benefits in a treaty. Um, these provisions are known as limitation of treaty benefits rules. And currently, for, for a non-Kenyan person to take advantage of you know, a reduction or an exemption in a tax rate on the basis of a treaty, then they would need to demonstrate that the entity in that other country is either listed in that country or at least 50% of its underlying ownership is held by individuals who are resident in that country. So this, this was set up to, to mitigate the risk of uh, treaty shopping and, and, and abuse of treaties. Um, lastly, on, on, on you know, uh, distributions by companies, where a company makes a distribution that uh, is deemed to come out of profits which have not been taxed, then an unusual tax in Kenya known as compensating tax uh, I say unusual because it's, you know, you don't find it in many other African countries. Um, so compensating tax gets triggered. So essentially uh, what, what each entity would be required to do is prior to making a distribution to check how much taxes it has paid over the years and, and see if the distribution itself uh, will have been covered by those taxes. Anything over and above is then deemed to have been paid out of untaxed profits and is subjected to tax at the rate of 30%, uh, equivalent to corporate income tax. Um, Kenya has excise and customs duties uh, applicable on importation of, uh, of products. So customs duties uh, top rate is 35%. Uh, you can get lower rates of between 10 and uh, 2010 and 35%, depending on the type of uh, product and the tariff classification uh, that is being imported. Uh, Kenya is part of the EAC, uh, East Africa Community Customs Union. So uh, any movement of goods within the, the customs territory uh, is, is zero rated. So if you've got a manufacturing concern in Kenya that sells uh, its products to you know, uh, either customers in Uganda or Tanzania, and it can demonstrate that you know these goods qualify for the rules of origin as having originated from Kenya, then such goods can be transported to and, and sold to customers in the region duty free. Um, Kenya also has transfer pricing rules uh, modeled from the OECD uh, guidelines. Um, so any 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 transaction between a Kenyan entity and a related non-Kenyan entity would fall within the ambit of transfer pricing. And essentially what, what this means is um, the Kenyan entity would be required to demonstrate that it has undertaken its transactions in an arm's length manner, in, you know, similar to what uh, would happen if it were transacting with a non-related entity. Uh, a recent change that uh, was was brought out in uh, in you know relating to transfer pricing is it, there are possibilities where transfer pricing rules would also kick in in a scenario where you've got unre unrelated entities. Uh, if the unrelated Kenya entity is located in a preferential tax regime, yeah, and a preferential tax regime means uh, you know a country where you know, it, it either does not tax income or taxes income at a rate that is less than 20% or doesn't have a framework for the exchange of information or does not allow access to banking information. So 
quite quite some wide uh, application as to when uh, transfer pricing can apply to non-related entities. Um, in terms of uh, you know the appeal structure, in case you know uh, an entity gets into a dispute with the tax authorities, Kenya has a very robust appeal structure, um, which allows taxpayers to appeal to uh, assessments issued by the tax authority first to to a tax appeals tribunal in the first instance, and then to a high court, and then to a court of appeal. And if there's any additional, you know, if there's any constitutional interpretation issue, then the matter can be taken up to the Supreme Court. Now, from an exit perspective, uh, Kenya does have uh, capital gains tax uh, rules, uh, which apply tax, CGT, capital gains tax on disposals. Yeah? And the current rate of tax is 15%, um, which is quite low in comparison to what you find in, in other countries in the region. Um, going back to what I, you know, what I said on DTAs, the double tax treaties, you may find that some of the double tax, double tax treaties that Kenya has in force uh, may exempt some of these transactions from, from tax in Kenya. Uh, and that would be useful to check uh, if and when uh, an entity is looking to exit uh, from the Kenya market. Um, yeah, Celia, that's it from, from me for now. Thank you, George. It's quite a mouthful, but lots of things, less, lots of things to keep yeah. in consideration when you when you do business in the country, Lee. Um, Absolutely. Faith, thanks, George. Um, Faith, if we turn to you from an employment perspective, um, can you give us a brief overview of the, the employment law and the general regime, how investor friendly would you regard that to be? Thank you. Thank you, Celia. So, I mean, the first thing that we usually say when we're talking about the employment regime in Kenya, especially in relation to, you know, foreign investors looking into the country is to just realize that, you know, from a general perspective, employment law in Kenya tends to be viewed as being very pro-employee or very, you know, one-sided in favor of the employee. And the courts are also perceived to sort of always try to take the side of the employee whenever a dispute arises. And that's just because of a perceived imbalance of power between the employer and the employee. So that's always the first thing to bear in mind as an employer or as an investor, and sort of to are on the side of caution in terms of, you know, rechecking what the laws are, uh, what the policies require, and, um, you know, seeking counsel as and when need be. So that's always like the first starting point or a, a caveat that we put out there. And the second thing related to that as well is that the employment framework tends to be very fragmented. So there's very many different statutes, all of which talk on employment and uh, sometimes with contradictions in between themselves and also a, a, a very robust uh, fragmented um, regime of regulations and then also case law. So generally the law just tends to be all over the place if I can put it casually like that. And so it makes it very difficult for employers trying to navigate um, how to do the right thing regarding to different employee related issues because we find a lot of you know clients or employee employers would come and say, but we looked at this law and this is what it says and, and you've got to sort of explain why even though that's what is in the law, there's a different case or a different judge in one court that you know made a ruling recently that sort of overturns that or doesn't apply that you know very specifically. So that's a very general comment, but it's a very good starting point um, to bear at the back of our minds when thinking about employment law in Kenya. The next thing that I'd like to highlight as well is that Kenya law tends to put a lot of emphasis on processes and procedures when it comes to dealing with different employee issues. So you've got on the one hand, like substance in terms of how you're dealing with employees and how you're treating them and whether you've got legitimate reasons to do as an employer, whatever you need to do, whether it's disciplinary action, whether it's uh, setting terms and conditions of employment or service. So you could get that substance and that content right. But then the courts and uh, the regulators like the labor officers will always have the question of, but did you follow the right procedure? And it's almost like a very tick box kind of exercise to just make sure that in doing the right thing, you also did it the right way. So we also like to also emphasize on that, that it's not enough to just be clear that this is what the substance of the law requires. You also need to tick that process and procedures box. And then unfortunately, to my earlier point, these processes are not, are not always outlined 
in 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 you know in one comprehensive document and how to deal with this is quite um you know we found a way to deal with this by encouraging employers to put in place a robust set of policies that tackle almost everything that you can conceive so that's a good way to put together everything that you need to be referring to from an employment law perspective um the other thing that you know we might mention around you know general employment law is that you know with this back to you know the points earlier made by Mahesh around you know the general investment climate and all of that this has been seen as a you know a, a, a year where costs to employers have have arisen risen quite a lot uh due to introduction of various levies uh, which I think we will touch on later but that's a good thing to sort of highlight that um costs to employers have shot up quite a lot and we are now assisting you know with devising interesting strategies to sort of um, try to contain what those costs are going to be and there's some expectation that this will continue to rise next year because of all the levies that that, that we will mention we will mention later um the last thing that i might want to just highlight around you know what we are seeing as well in the employment law regime is um, there's been proposals to do some amendments to, to the employment law. A lot of these have not kicked um, in the past few years, but there's been a move uh, with the current regime to sort of overturn or you know review a number of this legislation. And there's been a number of bills being introduced um, around the employment law framework. A very interesting one that's um, sort of an overrun from the times of COVID-19 is there's a bill now in parliament trying to sort of follow jurisprudence in the EU um, that proposes to introduce barriers for employers to contact employees during work hours or during uh, outside of official working hours. Um, the, the the Federation of Employers uh, in Kenya you know, is coming out strongly to, to challenge this bill, um, but that's something that we will all be sort of keeping an eye out for to see what, what what that pans out like. But this is something that I think was very relevant in the time of you know, COVID-19. Um, in an economy such as this, um, there are questions as to how implementable this is. It's, 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 it's a very informal type sector um, in terms of, of, of employment mostly. So that's, that's an interesting development that we're, keep, we're keeping an eye on. Um, I think those are sort of the general of, overview um, that I wanted to just put out on employment law. Um, Celia. Thanks, Faith. Yeah, very interesting. And a very interesting, this bill that you have, that you have kind of on the table currently. I think this, a lot of employees will be very happy about it, but employers obviously not so much. Um, Dennis, if I can turn to you, um, I think another hot topic on the continent is data protection regulation. And Kenya, I understand, has its own set of data protection and privacy rules. Can you give us a, a brief overview on that? Sure thing. Thank you, Celia. Um, so in Kenya, um, actually, incidentally, just this month, um, the Data Protection Act turned uh, four years old. So we have a Data Protection Act that is supplemented by the Data Protection General Regulations. We have enforcement regulations and we also have um, registration regulations. And the first thing I'd like to highlight as far as um, data protection is concerned and um, the topic we're discussing as, as far as investing in Kenya is concerned, is the fact that the act in Kenya applies to entities established in Kenya, which process personal data in Kenya, and also entities established elsewhere, meaning anywhere in the world that deal in personal data belonging to uh, persons in Kenya. So regardless of whether you're operating in Kenya or not, you might find yourself in a situation where the law applies to you. Um, this um, statute is primarily based on the general uh, general data protection regulation from the EU. Um, and the GDPR played actually a very significant contribution to the current act because the principles that we observe, um, most of the provisions that we have in the statute are more or less similar to what we would see in the, in the GDPR. And one of the unique um, elements of our law is that it requires all persons who act as data controllers, meaning you determine the purposes and the means of processing personal data, and data processors as well have to register with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And this requirement has um, brought about some challenges because you'll find most of the people are either not aware of the compliance requirement or have not complied, despite the fact that they are aware of the compliance requirement. Um, as at November um, 2023, we have about 3,000 registered entities, and most of them, because it's a duplication on the ODPC 
portal, you'll find that some entities are registered twice, both as a data controller and as a data processor. So in those particular instances, you find um, that we, we might have about 2,000 fully registered entities. And that's one of the key areas that the ODPC will be looking to enforce. And one of the areas that also our, um, our clients need to be aware of when they are entering into the market, venturing into Kenya. In terms of the compliance requirements beyond registration, we need to ensure that um, you know, clients are aware of the need to have the various policies and procedures in place to ensure that the processing of personal data is in compliance with the law. For instance, if you're developing um, privacy policies, you have to make sure that they are compliant with the Kenyan law. If it's retention policies, you have to ensure also that um, the various elements set out in the regulations are complied with. Um, and then in terms of consequences of non-compliance, um, the Kenyan government um, took an approach similar to um, the GDPR, whereby if you fail to comply, um, the exposure is about um, um, 5 million Kenya shillings, which is about at the current exchange rate, about um, 30,000 um, USD. Or you can have um, a fine of up to 1% of an undertaking's um, you know, um, turnover in the previous financial year. And another thing worth noting in this regard is that there are also criminal sanctions for various non-compliance uh, non issues. Um, and imprisonment goes up to a um, maximum period of 10 years. So those are some of the things that we need to be aware of as far as um, the topic of data protection is concerned in Kenya. And thank you, Dennis. Yeah, I know many of our clients across the continent are um, battling with this. I think there's, there's so many stringent requirements in many countries and every country has different requirements. So if you're investing across the continent, it can get quite complicated, but thank you for that. Um, George, I think we've spoken a lot about the changes that has been happening in the tax sector in um, Kenya. Have you seen any specific opportunities that have been created by some of these amendments um, for foreign investors to you know, kind of make it more tax efficient for them to do business in the country? Yeah, so 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 Celia, the government um, has set out uh, some incentives uh, for particular industries uh, that they would uh, they're looking to develop and grow. Uh, and one of such uh, uh, areas is the special economic zone uh, in, in Kenya. And Faith can come in and comment a little bit about what activities can be undertaken in a special economic zone. And, and, and from a tax perspective, the special economic zone uh, qualifies for a reduced tax rate of 10% in the first 10 years and 15% in the next 10 years before it hits the 30% corporate rate, uh, the normal corporate rate. Uh, in addition to that, uh, within the first 10 years, any payments made by an entity that is in the special economic zone is not subject to withholding taxes. Yeah? And VAT and stamp duties are also not applicable to entities in uh, operating in the SEZ. Um, the export processing zone is also a, a similar regime, which has similar uh, incentives uh, to, to, to investors. In terms of specific industries uh, that the government is keen on growing, um, entities that are operating in a carbon market exchange get a, a reduced rate of 15% corporate income tax for the first 10 years. Uh, similarly, entities that are in the construction space and construct at least 100,000 residential units also qualify for a reduced rate of 15%. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, depending on the level of investment uh, that uh, an investor is looking to make, you know, if the investment or the cumulative investment over a three-year period exceeds two billion Kenya shillings, which is uh, somewhat equivalent to thirty million US dollars, and the investment is done outside Nairobi or Mombasa County, then it qualifies for an investment allowance of one hundred and fifty percent. What that means is uh, the investor then gets a deduction of an extra 50% of the actual cost incurred uh, against their corporate income tax liability. And if that pushes them into a loss, then they can carry forward that loss in perpetuity. There are also import duty exemptions on, on certain items, such as equipment uh, used for manufacture. Um, so entities which uh, are looking to do manufacturing, then they can take advantage of that. By and large, uh, there they are specific uh, exemptions here and there. And, and I guess the main point for, for each investor would be to sort of try and understand what uh, exemptions they qualify for and, and take advantage of that. 
Thanks, George. You mentioned the special economic zones. Um, Faith, can you tell us a bit more about the employment implications of entities operating in these um, zones? Th thank you, Celia. Um, so just to roll back a little bit to, to, to something George mentioned, um, you know, SEZ entities could be entities that operate in really any area of the economy. There are certain areas that have been listed specifically under the law, uh, but the general outline is any legal activity can really be, you know, operated on from an, from a special economic zone. Um, from an employment perspective, they, there are a number of incentives or or, or advantages to, to operating from an SEZ. So, for example, all your employee registrations um, will be processed centrally to the central to the authority, the SEZ authority. Uh, same thing with your immigration permits if you're coming in with any expatriate employees or any foreign employees. And that tends to be, you know, it, it, it can be administratively cumbersome, especially for large operations, uh, huge manufacturers. Um, who are coming in, into this SEZ. So that advantage of having a one a, a one central processing point for all of your employment related registrations, for all of your processing of your, your employee needs, as well as for your immigration permits tends, tends to be something that's very saleable uh, from an SEZ perspective. Um, so that, that's the main thing from an SEZ uh, advantage perspective on an, on an employment side. Other than that, the, the employment framework is otherwise the same uh, between um, employment uh, of employees in an SEZ and in any other um, economic sector that's not necessarily within an SEZ. So the substantive law is essentially really just the same. But something that's the other thing that I might want to just mention, uh, which applies to SEZ, but also just a bit more generally, is that um, you know, in line with the current investment climate that we've we've been discussing, there's there's been a lot of clarity now recently from the courts around the ability of employers to sort of adjust uh, their terms and conditions of service, the terms of and con conditions of work, uh, through consulting with employees, but not necessarily needing you know specific employee consent. And we're seeing a lot of entities taking advantage of this to see how and where to tighten. Um, their TNCs with their employees and that clarity for employers allows them to go ahead and implement certain changes uh, unilaterally uh, without needing employees to exactly consent, but provided that that consultation process has gone ahead and, and we are seeing this um, coming up uh, qu quite a lot. So those are just the two things that I, I, I would highlight on, on, this, on this particular question, Celia. Um, thanks, Faith. Dennis, um, we've spoken about the complexity surrounding the data protection legislation. Um, what practical advice would you kind of give clients about how to navigate this? So thanks, Celia. Um, the first thing I believe um, would be to prepare the, rele the relevant policies, as I previously mentioned. Um, and one of the things that you need to note is that um, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner has been quite aggressive in terms of enforcing this particular statute. Initially, there was a bit of um, lag in terms of um, enforcement because the law was quite new. Um, the law was, um, most people were not aware. So they went on a, on a drive to make sure that there was public awareness of the law, the provisions and so on. But now we are seeing um, the ODPC taking a more stricter approach towards compliance, making sure that um, you know businesses are compliant and they've actually proceeded to issue fines to various entities. So to avoid being in such a scenario, the first thing that we're recommending to clients is um, become aware of the law, understand the compliance oblig obligations, and then take um, positive steps to ensure that you're compliant, be it registration, be it preparing the relevant policies, be, be it um, implementing the relevant um, technical and organizational measures, such as encryption, such as ensuring that you have um, password policies in place, um, ensuring that um, you, know, you report the various breaches that are occur within the organization to the ODPC. Those are some of the practical steps that we would um, suggest um, that businesses take. And some of the notab notable decisions you'll note are very, very um, common in terms of practice in, Ke in Kenya. For instance, we have um, a lot in terms of um, businesses, mobile lending businesses, we have a lot of businesses operating in this space. 
And these businesses have been flagged previously for non-compliance with the law. So um, we've found that um, the ODPC has aggressively um, issued enforcement and penalty notices, actually to the maximum amount, which is 5 million, as I had mentioned. And the reason for this is that they are trying to ensure that by issuing these fines, um, that clients and customers and operators in this space are compliant and are aware with, of, of the provisions of the law. So the recommendation here is to um, raise awareness and ensure that compliance is achieved as soon as possible. <clears throat> Um, thank you so much, um, Dines. George, um, we have a few minutes left. So do you perhaps just want to highlight, you know, one or two of the very significant tax changes that has happened in Kenya over the last year or so that, that may have an impact on investors? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, quickly, Celia, um, the, the three items I would, I would probably want to discuss are one, uh, introduction of digital services tax in Kenya, uh, which which applies on income earned by non-residents uh, from provision of services through any business that is carried out over an, an internet, uh, over the internet or a digital marketplace. Yeah, uh, and the rate of that is one point five percent of the gross income that is received. Yeah, um, VAT also applies on the same income, so at the rate of sixteen percent. Uh, so that's that's one of the new one of the new things. Uh, separately, um, in terms of you know a disposal, uh, if 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 there's any disposal happening at an offshore level, uh, a disposal of shares, and if you know it is seen that those shares derive at least twenty percent of their value from immovable property in Kenya, then that transaction, even if it occurs at an offshore level, it is subject to capital gains tax in Kenya. Uh, the same would still apply if the non-resident entity uh, is deemed to be managed and controlled from Kenya, then any sale of shares in that entity would be seen as uh, being subject to capital gains tax in Kenya. Now, lastly, um, one, one of the new, uh, you know, which has become the talk in town, one of the new uh, uh, requirements is that for every business in Kenya, um, for for the business to be a, to be allowed to take a deduction of all its expenses, then such expenses must be supported by an invoice issued through an electronic tax invoice management system. Um, what this means is, you know, any business that carries on, you know, uh, trade with non-registered uh, businesses. Will be will not be allowed to take a deduction of the expenses it incurs, uh, which is the government's move to try and enforce uh, try and force registration of the informal sector and increase the tax base. Thanks, George. Yeah, I think that seems to be in line with the trend across the continent. I think more and more tax mm -hmm. authorities are, are are moving in that direction. Um, my, my age, I think. When we have a final word from you, any concluding comments or observations? Th thanks, Celia. Um, I, I was taking some notes as as everyone was speaking, and I I thought I'd, I'd say three things. Um, I'd cover the challenges, and then look at the the enabling environment, and touch on the on the renewables. But I'll I'll skip the challenges for for today. Um, because uh, we're we're talking about investing, and and let's let's focus on that. So, so what, what's what's going to enable the the investments uh, in, into Kenya? Now, uh, I discussed the key partnerships that that Kenya is looking to to enhance with the U.S., with the U.K., and increasingly now with with the Middle East. Uh, we are still seeing a lot of support from the IMF and the World Bank. That's definitely going to to increase investor confidence. Um, without a doubt. Kenya still remains a uh, a hub for investment in in East Africa. So entry into wider Eastern Africa um, uh, becomes easier. Uh, the East African community has expanded with DRC, and and as of last night, I understand Somalia uh, has has been admitted as well. Uh, the the rest of the team have discussed enabling legislation. Uh, we've talked about SEZs. Uh, new capital markets legislation uh, and stuff happening in the in the mining sector. Um, whilst tax is is a bit of a thorny issue at the moment in in Kenya, uh, there are some 
highlights or so, so there's some, some light uh, in, in some areas, you know, there's an increase in the double tax treaties uh, uh, with, with some better insight and better tax planning, uh, you know, taking advantage of deal structuring, um, uh, moratoriums that are, that, are, that are present, amnesty that the revenue authorities are providing, I think you could minimize that tax exposure. And, and to sum up, uh, the sectors that I think are, are going to look interesting for investors in the next uh, 12, 18, 36 months, of course, renewables, energy, uh, the fintech sector, I think, is, is still going to be active, particularly platforms, microcredit, uh, tourism has picked up after COVID, so I think there will be some, some excitement in that space, uh, and lastly, uh, agriculture. So, so that's where I think the focus is going to be. Thanks, Maisha. Yeah, I think it's, it seems to be quite an exciting time for Kenya. Lots of opportunities um, for investors. But yeah, um, thank you so much to all of the panel members for the very interesting discussion. And thank you to all our attendees for joining us. You should be receiving an invite to our next Af Investing in Africa webinar early in the new year. So look out for it. But otherwise, have a wonderful festive season and we hope to see you soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.